Welcome back to Boccaccio in Wigs. We are on our first day, second story. We just finished the first story of the first day. And if you recall, it was about a really horrible man who defrauded literally everyone that he came in contact with, who so easily manipulated the gullible friar and had an entire town convinced that he was worthy of sainthood. And um, it's kind of funny hearing this, but it's also infuriating in a way that people like that can get away with murder if they have, if they have no qualms about lying under oath or in confession or what, whatever it might be. I had the misfortune of actually dating a con artist, and I am in good company with a long line of about a dozen or so women in the past 20 years who have um, unwittingly funded this man's life um, and then experienced the horrible, horrible ramifications of that. But it goes to show that we feeble humans are so often deceived and um, the importance of really checking our facts, trust but verify, we don't want to be closed off. We still want to be open and welcoming to new people in our homes and our hearts and communities. But we need to beware of um, these uh, the snakes among us because they exist. And uh, Boccaccio was well aware of that. And he was also kind of poking fun at um, just how gullible the church was and the the hypocrisy of elevating someone to sainthood who was truly just a horrible piece of garbage. Um, but ultimately, he really says that, you know, you don't need someone to be an intercessor between you and this higher power. Um, and that's another theme where he's critiquing the church. And when we talk about the church, we're specifically talking about the Catholic church. So they might say, um, become a Christian, but they're referring to Catholicism. All right, so settle in for our second story on the first day. Our little summary here. A Jew named Abraham, encouraged by Giannato di Civigni, goes to the court of Rome. And after observing the wickedness of the clergy, there we go again, he returns to Paris and becomes a Christian. Panfilo's story was praised in its entirety by the ladies, and parts of it moved them to laughter. After all had listened carefully and it had come to an end, the queen ordered Nefile, who was sitting next to Panfilo, to continue with a story of her own, the order of the entertainment thus begun. Nefile, who, remember, is our youngest, she's 18 years old, Nefile, who was endowed no less with courtly manners than with beauty, answered that she would gladly do so, and she began in this manner. Panfilo has shown us in his storytelling that God's mercy overlooks our errors when they result from matters that we cannot fathom. In my own tale, I intend to show you how this same mercy patiently endures the faults of those who with their words and deeds ought to bear witness to this mercy, and yet do the contrary. I shall show how it makes these things an argument of his infallible truth, so that with firmer conviction we may practice what we believe. I have heard it told, gracious ladies, that in Paris there once lived a great merchant and a good man by the name of Giannato di Cevini, a most honest and upright man who had a flourishing business in cloth. And he had a very close friend who was a rich Jew named Abraham, also a merchant and a straightforward, trustworthy person. Giannato, recognizing his friend's honesty and upright qualities, began to feel deep regret that the soul of such a valiant, wise, and good man, through lack of faith, would have to be lost to hell. Because of this, he began to plead with him in a friendly fashion to abandon the errors of the Jewish faith and to turn to the Christian truth, which, as he said, his friend could see prospering and increasing continuously, for it was holy and good, while in contrast, he could observe his own Judaism growing weak and coming to nothing. The Jew replied that he believed no faith was holy or good except the Jewish faith, 
and that since he had been born into it, he intended to live and die within it, nor could anything cause him to turn away from it. Giannato did not, however, abstain on this account from addressing similar words to him some days later, and from indicating to him in a clumsy way, as most merchants are wont to do, the reasons why our faith is better than the Jewish one. Although the Jew was a great master of Jewish law, he nonetheless moved, he nonetheless moved by the great friendship he had for Giannato, or perhaps by the words which the Holy Spirit sometimes places in the mouth of an ignorant man, began to find Giannato's arguments very entertaining. But he still remained fixed in his own beliefs and would not let himself be converted. And the more stubborn he remained, the more Giannato continued to entreat him, until the Jew, won over by such continuous insistence, declared, Now see here, Giannato, you want me to become a Christian. Well, I am willing to do so on one condition. First, I want to go to Rome to observe the man you say as God's vicar on earth. That would be the Pope. I want to observe his ways and customs and also those of his brother cardinals. And if they seem to me to be such men that between your words and their actions, I am able to comprehend that your faith is better than my own, just as you have worked to demonstrate it to me, I shall do what I told you. But if this is not the case, I shall remain the Jew that I am now. When Giannato heard this, he was extremely sad, and he said to himself, I have wasted my time, which I thought I had employed so well, believing that I might convert him. But if he goes to the court of Rome and sees the wicked and filthy lives of the clergy, not only will he not change from a Jew to a Christian, but if he had already become a Christian before, he would without a doubt return to being a Jew. So turning to Abraham, he said, Listen, my friend, why do you want to go to all that trouble and expense traveling from here to Rome? Not to mention the fact that for a rich man like yourself, the trip is full of dangers, both by land and by sea. Don't you think you can find someone to baptize you right here? And should you have any doubts concerning the faith that I've explained to you, where would you find better teachers and wiser men capable of clarifying anything you want to know right here? For these reasons, in my opinion, your journey is unnecessary. Remember that the priests there are just like those we have here, except for the fact that they are better insofar as they are nearer to the head of the flock. Therefore, you can save this journey for another time, for a pilgrimage to forgive your sins, and I may perhaps accompany you. To this, the Jew replied, I am convinced, Giannato, that things are the way you say they are, but to, br to be brief about it, if you want me to do what you have begged me so often to do, I am determined to go there. Otherwise, I shall do nothing about the matter. When Giannato saw his friend's determination, he said, Go then with my blessing. And he thought to himself that he would never become a Christian once he saw the court of Rome. But since it would make little difference one way or another, he stopped insisting. The Jew got on his horse and set out as quickly as he could for the court of Rome. And upon his arrival, he was received with honor by his Jewish friends. While he was living there, Without telling anyone why he had come, the Jew began carefully to observe the behavior of the Pope, the Cardinals, and the other prelates and courtiers. And from what he heard and saw for himself, he was a very perceptive man. From the highest to the lowest of them, they all shamelessly participated in the sin of lust, not only the natural kind of lust, but also the Sodom sodomitic variety without the least bit of remorse or shame. Now, remember, we are dealing with nearly 700 year old culture and norms where same sex relations were considered very, very bad. So excuse me for having to read those things out loud. And this they did to the extent that the influence of whores and young boys was of no little importance in obtaining great favors. Besides this, he observed that all of them were open gluttons, drinkers, and sots, and that after their lechery, just like animals, they were more servants of their bellies than of anything else. The more closely he observed them, the more he saw that they were all avaricious and greedy for money, and that they were just as likely to buy and sell human, even Christian, blood as they were to sell religious objects pertaining to the sacraments or connected to benefices. And in these commercial ventures, they carried on more trade and had more brokers than there were engaged in the textile or any other business in Paris. They called their blatant simony mediation and their gluttony maintenance. As if God did not know the intention of these wicked minds, not to mention the meaning of their words. 
and might allow himself to be fooled like men by the mere names of things. These, along with many other matters best left unmentioned, so displeased the Jew, for he was a sober and upright man, that he felt he had seen enough and decided to return to Paris, and so he did. When Giannato learned that he had returned, the last thing he thought about was his conversion, and he went to his friend, and together they celebrated his return. Then, when he had rested for a few days, Giannato asked his friend what he thought of the Holy Father and the Cardinals and the other courtiers. To this, to his question, the Jew promptly replied, I don't like them a bit, and may God condemn them all. And I tell you this because as far as I was able to determine, I saw there no holiness, no devotion, no good work or exemplary life or anything else among the clergy. Instead, lust, avarice, gluttony, fraud, envy, pride, and the like, and even worse, if worse than this is possible, were so completely in charge there that I believe that city is more of a forge for the devil's work than for God's, in my opinion. That shepherd of yours, and as a result, all of the others as well, are trying as quickly as possible and with all the talent and skill they have to reduce the Christian religion to nothing and to drive it from the face of the earth when they really should act as its, its supports and foundation. And since I've observed that in spite of all this, they do not succeed, but on the contrary, that your religion continuously grows and becomes brighter and more illustrious, I am justly of the opinion that it has the Holy Spirit as its foundation and support and that it is truer and holier than any other religion. Therefore, although I once was adamant and unheeding to your pleas, and did not want to become a Christian, now I tell you most frankly that I would allow nothing to prevent me from becoming a Christian. So, let us go to the church, and there, according to the custom of your holy faith, I shall be baptized. Giannato, who had expected his friend to say exactly the opposite, was the happiest man there ever was when he heard the Jew speak as he did. So he accompanied him to Notre Dame, Notre Dame, and asked Notre Dame, and asked the priests there to baptize Abraham. At his request, they did so immediately, and Giannato raised him from the baptismal font and renamed him Giovanni. And immediately afterward, he had him thoroughly instructed in our faith by the most distinguished teachers. He learned quickly and became a good and worthy man who lived a holy life.